I want to welcome you today to Northside Baptist Church here in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, Northside's located at 1100 East Cornwallis Drive here in Greensboro, if you need it, 27405. And we are here to serve you in this community here in Greensboro. Uh, we have a passion to, to win souls to Christ, but to make relationships and to, to meet the needs of our community. Uh, if you're just coming into the service today, you're going to see several things. We're going to have a time of, of just worshiping and praising God. You're going to hear some music today. Uh, we're going to have some prayer, some times of prayer today. And then we're just going to have some great time of studying the Word of God. Uh, we may even have something today for our children. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to sit back where you are and just enjoy some time of fellowship and spending time in God's Word. And let's walk away today with a new sense of where God wants us to go. And I pray uh, that maybe if you're looking for a church that you would come physically and visit us here at Northside Baptist Church. Enjoy the service today. I 
We want to welcome you today to uh, Northside Service, but uh, once again, I want to take a moment and I want to introduce you to somebody. This is the, the first of all, I have the, the, our chairman who has spent two years as our chairman that's in the room right now. That's Mike Hudgens, who's, your, who's playing right now. And I want to thank Mike. Everybody thank him. He has been two years as a chairman of Deacons is really something. And, and, uh, and I want to thank him for his two years of service. But I want to introduce you to our new chairman, Rick Williams. Rick Williams. And so, Rick, here, I know that you have a lot of responsibilities between COVID and who knows, maybe even snow <laughs> a little bit here. But here, I want to introduce you to our chairman who you see each week. But Rick Williams, congratulations and thank you for being a part of Northside. Thank you. And first, let me uh, also say thank you to Mike. Um, great job the last two years, Mike. And we appreciate everything you've done for us here at Northside. And I just want to say thank you to the deacons for having the confidence in me to uh, give me this, I think, privilege. I don't know, Mike. Uh, I kind of feel like um, I didn't, I wasn't able to make the meeting, so I might have got through under the bus. I don't know. But, <laughs> but no, uh, just thank you, and I look forward to uh, serving this year God in this church and serving the people of Northside and doing what he leads us to do in this community. And now getting on with the COVID, we are still at a point right now where we are, however you feel comfortable worshiping, whether that's with a mask, without a mask, even though things have kind of ramped up here in the last couple of weeks, uh, Guilford County has voted to put the mask mandate back in, but still right now that does not affect our establishment so we are still good with no mask if you don't want to wear a mask and if you feel more comfortable wearing a mask we're fine with that also we just want you to have an enjoyable worship experience here at Northside and come in and just worship and praise the Lord and thank you let, let us go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Father, we come to you today and just, we have many members dealing with this COVID issue at this time, and we lift all of those up to you, Father, and we just ask that you just take this virus away from them, heal their bodies, and just restore their health so that they are able to come back and join us here at Northside. And we, we ask, Father, just, if it be your will, you take this virus away from the earth, period. And just allow us to return to some normalcy. And we ask this morning that you just bless this house and just fill, your, fill this house with your spirit, Father. And just be with Pastor Steve as he brings your message earlier. And just allow us to just give all praise to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
believe that the Holy Bible was written by men divinely inspired and is a perfect treasure of heavenly instruction, that, that, it, that it has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter, that it reveals the principles by which God will judge us and therefore is and shall remain to the end of the world the true center of Christian union and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and opinions shall be tried. You may wonder what I'm reading from right now, but I'm reading this from the uh, Baptist. This is straight out of the Articles of Faith of uh, of many Baptist churches even to this day. This is what the articles of faith say. And yet, and yet, is is it really true? Is this really true? And, And here's another question I think I want us to answer today is what you think is true, your opinion about what is true or not true, does your opinion matter about what is true or not true? In fact, here's an article that I have 
from Barna, because any good Christian, of course, knows that if you need a statistic, you go to Barna. And, and Barna says this, it's a new Barna poll shows continued decline of Bible belief in America. The latest cultural research has revealed a razor-thin 51% uh, majority of Americans believe in a biblical view of God. This is down from 73% 30 years ago, and this research adds to the mounting evidence that Americans are both redefining and rejecting God. According to the latest release of findings from the American Worldview Inventory 2020 by Dr. George Barna, Director of Research for the Cultural Research Center, some of the largest drops in belief in a biblical description of God in the past 30 years are among youngest Americans, ages 18 to 29. That's down 26 points. The oldest Americans, i.e. born before 1946, is down 25 points. Do you hear that? In a shocking discovery, the largest group, the largest group discovery uh, that drop in belief were those attending Pentecostal or charismatic Protestant churches where they were down 27 points. Now listen to this. Stunningly, Americans are more confident about the existence of Satan than they are of God. Overall, 56% that Satan is an influential spirit being, yet almost half, 49%, are not fully confident that God truly exists. And 44% believe Jesus Christ sinned while on earth. Americans are also confused about the nature of the Holy Spirit, with over half, 52%, saying that the Holy Spirit is not a living entity, but merely a symbol of of God's power, presence, or purity. You may wonder where some of this confusion in belief comes from. Where is it that people begin to go off the edge of the cliff and stop believing? Or for that matter, have their beliefs so watered down? There's a verse that I want you to be aware of in, in, as we, we talk about this, but there's a, there's a verse in Scripture that says it this way. It says that they were with us but they were not of us. Because if they would have remained with us, they, they would still be with us. But because they did not remain with us, they were never of us. You know, there are many that, that just have this, this idea that, hey man, there's this one time I prayed a prayer, and you know, that means I got fire insurance for all eternity. And yet it didn't mean anything. And, and, and yet nothing ever happened after that. There's nothing that ever showed that something changed in their life. And so they, they, never, they, they never did follow through. They, they could just say, hey, man, I, I prayed a prayer once. That, doesn't, that means something, doesn't it? But there's no real love for Christ. There's, there's no real understanding of him. Another part about this is why, why is it that so many people don't really understand what they believe, or for that matter, aren't sure that they truly believe the Bible. One of the, the primary answers I can tell you right now is because they don't read it. That they don't spend time in God's Word. They don't know who Jesus is because they may know about Jesus and they may have heard about Jesus, but they don't have a relationship with Jesus. You know, one city uh, that I'm very familiar with is I'm familiar with Los Angeles, Los Angeles, California. You know, I, I can tell you things about Los Angeles, California. I can tell you all the football teams that have come and gone out of Los Angeles, California. But there's a problem with uh, how well I really do know Los Angeles, California. I've never, ever been to Los Angeles, California. So I can talk to you all day about it. There are those out there who can talk all day about who they think Jesus is, but they don't know who he is. He's, it's, they've never studied to show themselves really approved and, and begun to understand what the scriptures say about who Jesus is. And for that matter, that they haven't spent time to understand that God's word is the ultimate authority. 
what, what I read earlier from uh, the Baptist Articles of Faith is something that all Baptists are supposed to believe, and yet in a stunning, stunning uh, questionnaire, more and more we see that people don't have an absolved faith, absolute faith, in, in the, the inerrancy of the Scriptures, the inerrancy of the Word of God, because they don't take time to really study it today. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'm going to be around uh, verses 10 through 16. We're going to look at this, and I, there are other passages that, that we'll be in, and I'll take you there as we go. But in it, 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 it speaks to who it speaks to us about what we believe and how we should believe. Paul's talking in this, time, in this particular letter to Timothy, and he's, and he's trying to explain to him about how we should be equipped as believers. In fact, let's go back. I want to take you back, by the way, to verse 1 even of chapter 3. I wasn't going to do this, but I feel like it's necessary for us to get context about what Paul's talking about here when he's talking to Timothy and about the state of the believers and, and for that matter, the state of, the, of the, where, where Timothy is at this time and how he is in a city that is full of paganness and corruption and, and that, that the Christians need to stand out and, and demonstrate the right way to live, how to honor God in their life, how to get stronger in their faith, how to know what they believe. Chapter 3 of verse 1 says, as Paul writes this, that perilous times, now there are perilous times coming, but Paul says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Perilous times. For men will be lovers of themselves. You know, I could stop right there, and that could be the whole sermon today. We could talk about how men love themselves, how, how women, how children, uh, we all love ourselves so much. So much so that even in, in, in the world of politics, it seems more uh, necessary to try to give people what they want. To, to, to literally just, you know what, find out, you know, oh, you, what, you know, try, make, make promise to, promises to them to get that vote. When, when sometimes we, we need to just stand up and say, you know what, we need to stand on principle. What does God say about the way we should conduct ourselves? Even as believers, too many times we're afraid to even share our faith and be vocal about our faith for several reasons. For one, uh, we don't know what we believe. <laughs> We don't truly understand our faith. And secondly, because it's much easier to just kind of tell people what they want to hear and, and make them feel good about themselves. But it says here that in these perilous times that, that men will become lovers of themselves. And because they love themselves, they will be lovers of money, boasters, proud, Blasphemers, disobedient to parents. I'm, I must say this, and, and it, there, it, it just seems to be a common theme among even TV shows that our, our children are watching these days, that they always pose the parents as outright idiots. You know what I mean? I mean, and if, if I could call it out, I could call out a, a, a list of Disney shows where, where it seems to be so important to make the parents look like they're stupid. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying that there aren't some stupid parents out there in the world, okay? I know that there are. But, but it, it seems to be they want, they want to, to implant in children the idea that, man, that authority, question, question your parents. Be, you know, your parents are, are just, they're just dumb. That, you know, you do what you want to do. But it seems that there's that, that atmosphere. And I had, I had to mention that. We're getting into the uns now, by the way. You know what? There's a, there's a lot of uns that, that Paul mentions here that we need to not be doing, but what, the, such as unthankful, unholy, <laughs> unloving, unforgiving, 
And by the way, these uns here, we, we need to be careful of in our own life. When we talk about this, about, about the, for one, the, the unthankful. Well, one thing, by the way, whenever we pray and how Jesus even taught us to pray, a part of our prayer to God is always to focus on thanksgiving and what God's done for us. And if you think about it, every time, everybody do this work right now. Even if you're sitting on a couch right now, do this. Take a deep breath in. Okay, now take that breath out. Thank God for that, okay? In fact, we'll talk more about that when we talk about the fact that, that the Word of God is God breathed. God breathed. God breathed into you, in fact, into Adam, the breath of life. <laughs> but it's, it's God breathed. But the very fact that you have breath in your lungs is a gift from God, and you do not need to take it for granted. Don't be unthankful about what God has done for you. In fact, look for things. I'll never forget, I, I still remember a, a, a lady in one of my classes back in, in Charlotte who, uh, when we would ask for, for uh, praise time, we, we'd lift up praise, she would always say, hey, I've got to praise. I praise God that I am not sicker than I am right now. That my, that my condition, that from my stroke, that I'm not worse than I am right now. She was looking for the silver lining because she was thankful for what God had done. That's a heart of, thank, un, of thankfulness. So don't be one of those unthankful people or unholy. What does it mean to be unholy? Unholy. What, what does it mean? It, 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 if I could summarize it this way, everything that you are, who you are, who you worship, what, what you take into your ears, what, what, what you uh, dwell on, what you let, allow your mind to dwell on, like it says in Psalm 91, all of that plays into the, the holiness that is in your life. If you are a vile person, if, if you are a crude person all the time, then that is because that's how you feed your mind on those things. And, and we're taught in the scriptures that we're, we're to, to not be unholy. We're to be, that it says, unholy. We're to watch ourselves, watch our actions, watch what we listen to, watch what we uh, read. Don't, don't get involved in things that, that are, are just are, are crude or vulgar. You know, focus on the right things. Unforgiving. I can tell you right now, I could take you to family after family after family that is broken apart right now because of that sense of unforgiveness in their family. Nobody wants to forget. Nobody wants to take that first step and step out into that, and, into that aisleway and say, you know what, I, I want, I, and come humbly before their, their family member to, to get things right, to make things right that sense of unforgiveness. There are families that I know haven't spoken to each other in decades because of unforgiveness in their heart, in their life. Don't be one of those. Don't be a person of unforgiveness. And it, it says here that these, a lot of these things are the things, signs of, of, the, of, of the end times, of perilous times in the end where people get in this mindset where, where it gets to the point there is so little forgiveness present or even possible that the situation becomes irreconcilable. I can tell you, I can take you to, to, to marriage after marriage that has failed and led to divorce because of unforgiveness. Some other things here that Paul mentions, things that, that are so pre pre prevalent, and these things here, even in our society, and our nation's a good example, but, the, but being slanderers, being, being a slanderer, a slanderous person, being, being someone who constantly bends and twists the truth. And I know that, that in the, the news today, in the media today, I, I truly will say that there is there's hardly a media organization left in this world that we can trust as Christians. I mean that, not one. There's not one that we can rely on to give us truth and to give us the unadulterated, honest, transparent truth. 
We are under a government now that has, has lost its compass and has no ability to share with us the honest truth. Every decision that is made within the bounds of government is made under the premise of how is this going to look and how are they going to feel about it. It's not about honesty anymore. There are slanderers that, that, that we're surrounded by slanderers even, even now. And, and I think this is a part of that atmosphere in the last days here that, that we're speaking of. It says here that there will be no self-control. What, what more can we say in this society? There is no self-control. Let me give you a, an honest example, and, and that's that, that we don't even want to wait until marriage to have sex yes I use the s word we don't we don't even want to wait anymore and it's almost like it's expected in a relationship not to not to honor the the sanctity of marriage and in turn oh by the way if if by the way if you get pregnant along the way because you're having sex out of marriage you can always run down to the clinic and get an abortion what kind of self-discipline, what kind of self-control is, is, is that, that? There's none. We, we live in a society that, that is so focused on ourselves inwardly, my right, my choice, my body, my choice, uh, and, and, and we'll use it conveniently at the right time in the right place. It says here that there will be brutal despisers of good, and we see that now, don't we? Are you a goody two shoes? <laughs> are you considered one? Are, but but there, there are people who literally uh, uh, resent you and hate you because you, you want good. Traitors, headstrong, haughty. Haughty, by the way, if I'm from Alabama, howdy. Haughty. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God what's the old saying that's been around for 40 years if it feels good do it if it feels good do it you know as long as it feels good to you just do it just do it See, what breaks my heart is I, 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 just, I just rattled off a lot of statistics about the fact that more than half of the people that are even in church don't believe the Bible is the inspired and inerrant Word of God. They've shot themselves in the foot. They have no compass. Yeah, that's right. I expect people outside of the church to not believe. I really do. I expect people that, that are, are not saved to, to be in the Romans 1.18 mindset that, that their eyes are darkened to the gospel. And that's what we're here for. We're the light. But it breaks my heart when we as believers begin to become shallow in what we believe. So what drives people not to think the Bible is the infallible, inerrant Word of God? Well, it's all the things I just listed. Oh, you thought I was just going to give you a, an apologetic tour today. We'll get there. But I think you need to understand the mindset the mindset of people today. <laughs> in fact, in verse 5, it says this, about all that I've shared with you, and that's this, people will have a form of godliness, a form of godliness, but they'll deny the power. They'll deny the power. Oh, they can say all the right things. They can act all the right ways. But get them behind closed doors. And you'll find that their, their walk doesn't match their talk. 
Paul's even teaching Timothy about some of these people that have gotten in this mindset. He says, from such people, <laughs> he says, and from such people, turn away. There's, there's a, kind of more of a psychological term that we sometimes hear about toxic relationships and having, having people in your life that are toxic. And, and the truth, truth be told that there are those people that you may have in your life that, that are such bad examples that you need to be very careful about how much influence and sway you give them in your life. And Paul's trying to teach Timothy this so that he, he can teach the people there so that they don't get sucked in by those around them and outside of the church in, in those that are hypocrites inside of the church. He's trying to make sure that they're okay. Verse 6 says, For of this sort are those who creep into households and to make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sin, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. What is the truth? What is the truth? If you're um, listening to me right now and you've got something sitting in your lap, you may, be looking, you may be looking right down at the truth right now. It's there. It, 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 there's answers that you have. Verse 7 says, Always learning and never able to learn to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses... So do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs was also. And just so I don't just glaze over Janus and Jambres, in this example, this is an old, they were Old Testament people, and they are mentioned only this time in the Old Testament, uh, and they, we think that they were magicians. They were uh, soothsayers, mag magicians, and, and he uses this as an example to show about two that were misleading the people and who, would, hey, who had corrupt minds. So this leads us somewhere here because, first of all, I hope that as I'm talking about all these things that more and more you see that your state of mind bears a strong connection to what you believe. To believe the Bible is the infallible and inerrant Word of God. To believe that the Bible is God's Word to us means that you have had to have spent a lot of time in God's Word. You've had to spend time in prayer to begin to know and understand more of God's Word. And this has to be the central piece and everything that you do as a believer, this is where you get your foundation. Verse 10 says, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all, the Lord delivered me. I love this. By, by the way, I used to kind of share with you a little bit of, like, let me get you in my head for a second. It's a scary place. But, but there, there were moments in my life uh, that <laughs> I just thought that Paul was one of the cockiest, most arrogant men I've ever seen in my life. I'm like, how dare he try to say, hey, follow my example, and, and, and to say, you know, you want to know how to live? Look, look at me. And at first I thought he was shining a light on himself, but the more I've read about Paul and his deep love for those that he ministered to, I began to realize that he wasn't shining light on himself at all, but he was teaching us 
how, the, how to shine the light on Jesus in our life. And in turn, through Jesus, we're able to do anything, Philippians 4.13. And, and he was shining that light to show people, look, look what I've been through. Look at the pain. I've been left for dead at the gates of cities. And yet, and yet, God brought me through. And he's saying this here to say, Hey, I want you, he's not afraid to say, follow my doctrine, what I've been given. Follow me, follow my example. Twelve, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I just, do you realize what Paul just told? <laughs> what, what he's just told the people in this letter and what he's writing? See, right now I could take you to uh, several churches and I could get there, I, we could sit there and listen to their pastor and that pastor will tell you, hey, you want to you wanna get from God, just give and give and give and what he'll do is he'll give back to you. He'll give back to you. It's, it's that name it and claim it kind of a, 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 of a, a religion, that blab it and grab it, prosperity gospel. But what we're taught by Paul in the scriptures is there are times in our Christian walk that our faith in Christ is not going to lead us into bliss. <laughs> into bliss. Ooh, this is just so... It's not going to lead us to paradise. It says here that we will be persecuted because of our faith in Christ. Because of your belief in that infallible and inerrant word of God, you're going to have so much in your life. You're going to have so many issues in your life. You're going to have a conflict with people because of what you believe. If you don't believe that, go talk to a few atheists right now, and you'll see. Let's go get Stephen Hawking out of the grave, and let's see what he has to say about it now, because he definitely believes in Jesus. 13, but evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 14, but you must continue in the things which ha you have learned and have been assured of knowing from, the, from whom you have learned them. Paul's saying you need, to you need to know what you believe, you need to hold firm with what you believe and hold fast in what you believe. And from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. First and foremost, your belief system, your worldview begins at Jesus Christ. Your worldview be begins at Jesus Christ. And it leads us to this scripture to hold firm and fast to, that all Scripture, 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do you believe this verse? In fact, all Scripture is, is by inspiration. The, the, and I, I'll mispronounce it, but it's Theos Nuptos, which is God-breathed, inspired by God. It is God-breathed. God, you'll find uh, throughout the, the New Testament, you'll find where God breathed out upon them. Even when, when, when he created Adam, he breathed into him the breath of life. And the Holy Scriptures are God. God breathed. They're God breathed. If, in fact, if you'll turn to First uh, uh, Peter, First Peter one twenty, it says it this way: Knowing this, uh, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Did you hear that? Holy men of God were, were literally, 
as, as the holy, holy men of God spoke, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, as, as the scriptures were breathed out upon them of what to write, they, they penned the scriptures. They're not of a manly interpretation. They're from the Holy Spirit, inspired divinely by God. Let me ask you this. What, where do you stand on this today? Are you one who can testify that you believe that the, that the scriptures are everything we need for life and godliness in this life? Are you willing to testify to others that? Are you ashamed? Are you embarrassed? Or do you fully believe that the scriptures are divinely inspired in the word of God? Let me tell you, your, your, eternal, your eternal life Rest upon what the scriptures say. I'm encouraging you today. You, you may, you know what, you may say, well, you know, I've got some reading I need to do, and that's fine. You want to go get alone with God and get with the scriptures, I encourage you to do it. But whatever you do, don't you live another day of your life thinking that the scriptures are not the divinely inspired, 100% inerrant word of God. Spend some time in the scriptures. Spend some time alone with God just praying, God, help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. And he'll provide all the answers you would ever need. Would you pray with me? Father, in Jesus' name, would you take these words, take this message, sear them on my, sear them on our hearts. Help us to see, Lord, that your word is everything we need for life, for godliness, for instruction, for correction, for training. God, I pray that you would breathe upon us the breath of life. Help us to see you as we need to see you. Not how we just want to see you. Help us to see you as who you really are. You're our Savior and our Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.